A good hobby should be entertaining, fulfilling, and should enhance your life. So if it's not doing that last part because it's at odds with your financial goals, then something has to change. I think a lot of people like to think of their hobbies as sacred cows. They are a part of your identity. They are your point of entry to your community, or in some cases, your family. It's the thing that brings you all together. But you really have to do the math. Think about how much these things are costing you in the short run and in the long run. Welcome to the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. Today we're talking about expensive hobbies. Ooh, expensive. That's your favorite word, isn't it? It is, because <laughs> I might have a couple of them. Well, I don't know, because what's the difference between an expensive hobby and an expensive habit? Like, <laughs> is buying books that I don't read an expensive hobby or an expensive habit? Um, I feel like Oprah and Well, Megan. reading the book would be a hobby. The idea or the act of buying them and not reading them, I would say, is a habit. A bad habit at that. You're splitting hairs. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Oprah and Meghan Markle where she was like, were you silent or were you silenced? <laughs> That's when you just stop and nod your head. Right. Whatever you say, Mama O. <laughs> Is it a hobby or is it a habit? Yeah. No, this is a really good topic of conversation. And I will admittedly say I'm going to have to try really hard not to sound judgy because that, I think that's like a natural byproduct of talking about these things. It's like, well, it's talking about expensive hobbies is something that you people are doing and you should probably stop or something. But I will say I get admittedly frustrated with people who are like, I don't know, you know, like I, I can't find the money and, and, you know, I would love to see, I would love to invest more, but I, but I can't, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe we take a look at some of these <laughs> really expensive hobbies that you have and let's see if maybe we could shave off something from there. I, I am less judgy about this because it's so tough, like in social settings or if you're on the dating scene, like after somebody asks, what do you do for a living? The next question that inevitably comes up is, what do you like to do for fun? Yeah. And while accomplishing your financial goals is <laughs> fun, can be fun, it's the kind of line that gets you dubbed as corny, like, or branded as a member of LLC Twitter. Like, yeah. it's always nice to have something else to talk about, something that you just do because you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm not good at small talk anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. And I don't lead with the, oh, well, I manage my money or I'm a personal <laughs> finance expert. No, I'm a I don't, money nerd. I'm a money nerd. No, I don't do that. Yeah, that's, that's like... <laughs> A cue for someone to say, all right, well, nice to meet you. I'm going to go <laughs> on the other side of the room now. Well, how do you normally respond when people ask? I just respond with my interests. I, I do, I tend to throw out like a little bit of like, you know, personal finance and entrepreneurship just to kind of see if flex. people are. No, <laughs> I don't think that's a flex. I think it's being honest. Those are the <laughs> things that I'm genuinely interested in. Um, that's not work to me for the most part. So I can do that and enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting topic. So, but, but here's, here's how I think about hobbies. I think one, I think it's fine to have them like in general, and it's fine to spend money on them. I know there is a corner of the world where people feel like for some reason, hobbies should be a waste. Yeah. They're just it's naturally ridiculous. wasteful. I don't, yeah. I don't agree with that at all. Um, and to your point, I think they are oftentimes a mechanism to build or nurture relationships with people. Um, but some of them, just just be honest, can be like crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think people just kind of build those costs into their lives. And again, that's fine if you can afford it. But I do think that if you having an expensive hobby is getting in the way of you achieving certain financial goals that are really important to you or your family, they might be an area that you look at and say, all right, maybe I can pull back a little bit. Yeah, I think a lot of people build their entire social identity around their hobbies. Yes. And so the notion of trimming spending in that area is just out of the question. Yes. Like, quitting a hobby is incredibly hard because it feels like a breakup. Yeah. You know how like when you break up with someone, it's painful because a lot of your identity and friendships are wrapped up in that person and your, your couple them. Exactly. Yeah. Coupled them. I like that word. <laughs> but the same thing happens with hobbies or any long-term pursuit. They kind of have like this grip on you. I remember the first time I had to break up with a hobby. It was in high school. Well, your hobby is not a person. It sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> like 
Okay. Well, I don't want to say quit because I didn't actually quit. I okay. just kind of break up with a hobby. <laughs> yes, I it's broke ridiculous. up with a hobby. <laughs> anyway, it was in high school and I played basketball because my two best friends did. And as y'all know, high school sports take up a ton of time. There's practice every day of the week. There's games on the weekends. There's travel. So it's a lot of time and energy. And I knew I wasn't good enough to play at the collegiate level. And I had other interests, like namely getting paid. I wanted to have a job and make my own money. Um, And I wanted to be a dual enrollment student to get ahead of college, get ahead in college. Anyway, there came a point where I just didn't try out for the team because I already knew like it was going to be a waste. And absolutely nobody was surprised. (laughs) It's not it's not like I was a star player, but I did have to do some identity work because for a long time I had identified as an athlete and like, you know, uh, playing on girls sports teams. And I had to figure out how I could be around the thing that I love, which was basketball, without paying such a steep cost. So I became the team manager and still got to go with the team. That's not a breakup, then. (laughs) You got put in the friend zone. You got friend zoned. (laughs) Friends with benefits. Oh, okay. (laughs) People throwing sweaty towels at you. Yes. Oh, good for you. Just don't call me the water girl. I had more responsibilities. (laughs) than just getting towels and water. I was, you know, a a cheerleader of sorts. (laughs) Anyway. Yeah. (laughs) You weren't good enough. (laughs) That's what that's called. Don't be mean. (laughs) That hobby. (laughs) Hmm. No, seriously, that hobby, you know, at that time, it really only cost me my time because I, you know, I was in high school, but... To your point, there are hobbies that have steeper financial impacts. I had a very similar experience with basketball. I loved basketball. It was a huge part of my childhood and my teenage years. But the rubber met the road at a certain point. And I was like, all right, if you continue to do this, then you are really just doing this for free. Yeah, knowing that there are other options out there or things that you could do with your time, building a skill set, trying to get a job, trying to focus on getting into college. I can imagine that a lot of people have a similar uh, breakup story yes. right around high school <laughs> or shortly thereafter. Yeah, it's almost kind of forced function in high school because you're still with your parents or with some sort of, you know, older guardian. Mm-hmm. But as you become an adult, who is holding you accountable for the situations where the rubber meets the road? Yeah. And you now need to decide if this thing that you're interested in is really just a hobby or some step towards your life ambition. I love this because I did not... I wasn't thinking about hobbies like that, but you're right. It's like, (laughs) to your point, at that intersection where money becomes an issue is when you officially Mm -hmm. define something as a hobby. Mm -hmm. It's no longer an ambition. It's no longer something that you're doing for fun or that you believe has the abilities to take you around the world. Exactly. Once you let go of the possibilities, that's when you officially label it a hobby. And that can be kind of difficult to wrap your head around. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the most... um, Expensive hobbies. And, and there's a long list of them. And this is, by the way, a very unofficial list. Um, <laughs> and I feel like we also need to add a disclaimer here uh, and apologize to all of our close family and friends who may feel slightly judged by <laughs> us listing or ranking some of these particular topics as really expensive hobbies. But I think the first one that comes to mind are car lovers. Mm. Yeah. I love a car lover. You love a car lover. You know, I'm close to a you lot come of car, from a yeah, car I come from a family, long line, a long of, car line lovers. of car lovers. It's genetic. I mean, Bo's a car lover. I know. He's certified. He like, is. He is. Bo is our four year old. Yeah. Yeah. He he loves cars and he does not get it from my bloodline. No. Uh, at all. <laughs> We're not car people by any means. We grew up in urban areas. So like having a car was like it's you have to nuisance. really love cars yeah. to have a car in Brooklyn, New York City. Because yeah. it's really, really expensive. But even outside of urban areas, um, having a car, loving cars, being a car enthusiast mm-hmm. or car guy, car gal, whatever they're called, it is really expensive. And so I did a couple of clicking around just to get a general idea. And, and I actually had to do this because I don't, I'm not familiar with these things. I don't do these things. Uh, but getting a car detailed, you used to get your car detailed. I sure did. Quite a bit. I still do, just far less frequently. Yeah, yeah. So does that sound about right? Uh, I'm looking at some notes here. So getting yeah. a car detailed is about $100. It could be a little bit more if you went to a fancier car shop. Yeah, car I would say salon. that's more of a deep clean. <laughs> a deep clean? Yeah. Okay. 
detailing is, you know, it takes all day. They use like a feather to get in between the cracks and the crevices. Really? It, it can be way more expensive oh, than a hundred. Oh, okay. Well, then the term car spa makes a little yeah. bit more sense then. <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. So yeah, so that's $100. Um, you want an audio system in mm-hmm. your car. That's easily, I would say, like $500. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are less expensive options. Um, hey, you want to put some rims on that thing? Easily yeah. per rim, like 100 to, th- like, let's just call it $300. These like, are you can reasonable get, prices. Yeah, yeah, you can get, like, less expensive rims, but, like, they're not necessarily going to be <laughs> they rims tans, that but people... They clean. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's some... $300 easily per rim. Uh, you want to get those windows tinted depending on the degree of the tent or the fancy. You know, they've got all kinds of yeah, levels UV. of the tent now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want it reflective or non reflective or you want it to k- keep the car cool. It gets really, really expensive. That's easily another $400. And we haven't even included like the cost of the car yet. Mm-hmm. Right, repairs or gasoline, um, and on top of that, naturally, we're going to call out this statistic. We've been following money and financial trends for years. This one just seems to consistently be going up, and it is the average car note mm-hmm. in the United States. And this number, according to Lending Tree, is now at five hundred and sixty-three dollars. That is the wow. average amount of money that the typical American is spending on the cost of paying off their car. Should have probably done a little bit more research to figure out what those terms are, but the last time I checked, that number has also gone up. And so the typical loan period was around five years, and now that number is closer to like seven, maybe even eight years. Now, for people who are leasing, that monthly payment is a little lower. It's at $450 a month, but that's still a lot of money. And obviously... You know, as we're thinking about what the true cost of this and we're projecting into the future, it just makes sense that we say, well, what would happen if you were to just invest that money? So we find us a little calculator. We punch those numbers in. Assuming a seven-year term, 7% rate of return. So we're being very, very conservative here. The money that people typically spend or on average spend for a car note, if that were invested into the market over that same period, they would end up with around $60,000, right? So $60,000 sitting in an account that you own and you can do something with as opposed to $60,000 you spent having a really nice car Mm -hmm. that you enjoy, which you're entitled to enjoy. That you can't sell for $60,000. But you certainly can't sell it for $60,000, right? Now, take that a step further. Let's say they did nothing else. They didn't... Let's say... Let's take that a step further. Let's say they did nothing else. They've got $60,000. They don't invest another dime and they just allow that money to sit there for another 25 years. Now, using those same percentages, rate of return, you are looking at around $325,000. Wow. You buy a whole fleet of cars in 25 years. You could. Yeah. That's the cost of being a car lover. That's a bit (laughs) extreme. But... That's the alternative, right? That's the, that's, alternative. that's the alternative. That's what you could that's what else you could have done as opposed to committing to owning a really expensive car. Yeah. So I would say an alternative is quite naturally is to drive simpler, more reliable, less expensive cars. In a perfect world, you can use cash to pay for your car. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have a note, which means that you don't have this monthly payment going out uh, into an asset that depreciates over time. Instead, you are taking that money and putting it into things that grow uh, and add value that you will retain and continue to grow so long as you allow it to compound. Um, I'm a big fan of good old-fashioned, simple, reliable cars and when I want to stunt and I want to be fancy or I need a bigger car or something with a little bit more uh, sex appeal, <laughs> you just go ahead and rent it. <laughs> yes, I love it. Uh, those are great options if you don't already own an expensive car. I would say another option if you already have an expensive car that you know is expensive and you're upside down on selling it, an alternative would be to actually share it when you're not using it. So the extra income that you earn can offset the note or maybe even the maintenance. 
a friend of mine actually just tried Toro the other day. She landed in Atlanta airport and had a rental car with one of the traditional rental car companies. Turns out they didn't have a car for her and they were just like, mm, sorry. I read about that. There is a stunning uh, decline in yeah. rental car inventory. Yeah. So in comes Toro to save the day. So Toro is a car sharing platform, one of the larger ones. There are several of them. But you basically treat it like an Airbnb. If you have a car that you're not using, you just kind of list it on there and people can come get it and they return it and you're insured through Toro. And, you know, it's it's very similar to home sharing. I, I like that idea, but honestly, I'm not a car person. But if I were, I there's no way I would allow a stranger to pick up and take my precious car. We say that now until, you know, it becomes normal like Uber and Airbnb right. and DoorDash. Like we give strangers our personal information all the time You're right. just to get some fries. You're right. And <laughs> and when I think about 2020, and I thought about this often, I was like the number of people who had expensive cars that were quarantining and couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, you ain't there was got no commute. nothing you could do. Mm-hmm. You don't have a commute. It's not like you get in the car and go somewhere. But you still got that note. I know. That 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 probably really, really hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So if you live near like a stadium or an airport, that might be an option for you. Yeah. Uh, another option I have is to join a car club. Now, the downside of these is that they typically come with membership dues. But again, I have two friends that are part of them. One is in a car club for old schools and one is in a car club for Porsches. But they talk about all the time the amount of time and money that they save because of the ability to exchange trade secrets or get special deals on insurance through the clubs, like economies of scale. The fact that there's so many people that insurance companies will offer a discount and they're even able to troubleshoot issues. Plus, as an added bonus, we all know that cars are depreciating assets, meaning they, the value of that car goes down the more you drive it and then customizing them further can be a pursuit that doesn't pay for itself. Another benefit of joining car clubs is if and when you're ready to sell, many of them, many of the car owners don't have to list it in the traditional way because they already have like a gang of active Mm. buyers. They have somebody who will value that tailpipe the same way that you value that tailpipe and is willing to kind of pay for it instead of going through like a traditional market where it's like, I didn't tell you to put that tailpipe on there. I bet that's a thing. I think it is. There's I was hoping be. there was a part called the tailpipe <laughs> because There's I use that example. A Facebook group for tailpipe. And yeah, I, I get, love I'm, it. I've seen it in my mind. It's, it's a golden <laughs> tailpipe that just <laughs> protrudes farther out the back of the car. Yeah, this one's got twists and turns like twisted a twisted tailpipe pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet that's a thing. Love it. All right. So that's cars. We all know they can be expensive. I apologize again to all of the car enthusiasts there. Hopefully you're in a good position financially. But if you are not, we offered up a couple of recommendations you could consider to help get the cost of that hobby or that passion down a little bit so that you can reroute that money to other things. Now let's move on to the second one. This is a big one too, and I can already feel the, the daggers, the daggers coming, coming from at across me, the table. But I'm going to say it anyway, <laughs> and it is sport fandom. I have so many friends and family members that are die-hard sport fans. Like I think the best example, maybe not the best example, but certainly one that comes to mind is the television show This Is Us. It's very tender, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a tearjerker kind of show, but part of the um, part of the Pearson family, which is the main family that it's, uh, the show is centered around, they, they came from Pittsburgh and they are huge yes. Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Oh, Steelers fans. They have all the things. Yeah. They are like, they, they've got the jerseys, they've got, you know, the, the, the garage, they have kids play sets, they have a mini Pittsburgh <laughs> Steelers stadium yes. thing. Like they are just die hard Pittsburgh Steeler family. It is in their blood. I have friends like that who are like huge New York Giants fans. Oh, yeah. They are season even I mean, even through like losing seasons. Oh yeah. They are just completely fanatic about being a sports fan. Well, you know I remember a bit about that. Yeah, I remember when we met uh-huh. and you couldn't believe my obsession with March Madness. Yeah. Like it was a full day event, a full several weeks. Yeah, about event. to say it's not a day. <laughs> With the brackets and the pom-poms and the tailgating and the superstitions, like, all of it was a thing that you just did not understand. It's not that I didn't understand it. Um, I just never witnessed collegiate sports 
um, and people coming together, <laughs> like <laughs> like to that degree. Like yeah. shout out to the UNC Tar Heel Woo-woo. fan base out there. And, and again, it's beyond just being a UNC fan. It's like being a UNC fan and also just hating all things Duke. Like <laughs> it was a whole thing. And I when we met, it was like the beginning of it. So you were, you know, literally glowing powder blue every time I saw you. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, but um, sports fans, let's talk about it. So you got your what license plates? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can get cakes, custom jerseys. You know how much a um a jersey costs? Ooh, the last time I bought a jersey, I feel like I paid like sixty or seventy dollars for it. Yeah, it's about one hundred and twenty bucks now for Dang. just a regular NFL jersey. Not even like the tailored ones to fit no, if women. You wanted- Oh, yeah. I can't even imagine what those yeah, are. Yeah, those were always more expensive. I would just get a, a unisex one. Yeah. So the custom jerseys will run you at least $350. Dang. Right? And so if you want to get, like, the streaming service where you can watch all of the games, that one is now running around $400 a season. Uh, and Just to watch it? To have the ability to watch all the games. Dang. Likely on your television. I'm sure they limit the number of screens. Yeah. And then you can watch it on the app. Yep. Um, and then I did some research. The average cost of an NFL ticket uh, is $154 mm. per person. Mm. Yeah. That's a flight. That is a flight. Well, wow. I mean, it's a short flight. I mean, <laughs> it's Vieta, a short flight. Tampa. <laughs> That's still a flight. Roughly. One way. <laughs> <laughs> if you book in advance, maybe it's a round It trip. depends on what airline, too. No. anyway my point is from the cost of the jerseys to the streaming platforms to the tickets we're not even talking about season ticket holders and by the way that 154 that's likely like Mm mid-range tickets you want nicer tickets or like a better view it's probably going to be significantly more expensive um what this also doesn't include is the built-in cost of having a man cave oh yeah yeah now I can feel or the guys she coming at me. I feel she like shed. I'm, she sheds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl's she shed. <laughs> but the cost of having a man cave, right? So you've got square footage dedicated just to your sports fandom. You've got decor in there. You've got a cooler. <laughs> you may have uh, a special refrigerator. Of course, you have the flat screen television. Maybe it's the one with the curve. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got the, the built-in speakers, all of these things. Easily $5,000 worth oh, of yeah. equipment in that room dedicated to that one day a week. It's like church. It is. It is. With it the is multiple the, screens. Multiple screens. You've you got to watch all the games. Absolutely. You might even, I've seen people have the game on. They've got the multiple screens within the screen. They've got the uh, the <laughs> tablet. <laughs> They've got their phone. They're getting the alerts. <laughs> you <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. You're on Twitter yeah. doing the play-by-play. You've got some money riding on it. So this is also not including, <laughs> right? Like amount of money that you're spending or on hoping that, that you get it back. Yes. Now, all right. Now we can talk about Wi-Fi. <laughs> Well, this taxes. is the thing because it seems like an attack towards <laughs> you're crossing the line. Now. <laughs> well, this is the thing about this particular hobby is that it's the sneaky kind of expensive because there typically isn't like a a, a budget category for sports. Yes, it's like all the money you're spending on these sports shows up in a bunch of different categories. It's a slight uptick in your grocery bill, yep. more money in your gas, then there's travel, entertainment. Wi-Fi, so you can actually stream all those games, home goods. It it shows up everywhere. Yeah. And the irony of this whole thing is that the price of being a fan goes up the better the team does. Yes. <laughs> so, like, if your team makes it to the Super Bowl and wins, that's a wrap. Like more you, games. You, more games. More streaming. More, more parties, commemorative, you know, more gear. More wings. <laughs> <laughs> like... More meatballs. Your meatball budget is going yes. through the roof because your team is so successful. Yes. Yeah. No, so I get it. I'm obviously not pro give up on sports. I love sports. Um, my recommendations here would be first figure out a way to track it. Either use a budgeting app and like tag your expenses accordingly or maybe dedicate a credit card to all things sports. Do you remember when I had that Saints credit card? I don't think you remember. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I used to have a a New Orleans Saints credit card. Anyway, dedicate a credit card to all things sports or you can go old school and just use cash. Come up with an envelope system and when you run out of that money, it's a wrap. Because once you set a boundary about how much you're willing to spend, if there's something you still want or something you still want to do, you can get really creative and lean on other fans and your team community to help you get it. 
but there still has to be a boundary. There has to be something that triggers a flag on the play. (laughs) Sports metaphor. Boom. (laughs) And then last but not least, my um, last tip would be to take advantage of free. Like the reality is sports fandom, as passionate as we are, can sometimes be very fickle. So Facebook isn't just good for watching fans like burn their gear when somebody gets traded or misses a big shot. Sometimes it's about putting your wishes in the universe and seeing if anyone in your connections has access to free tickets through their job or some other program or just looking at the Facebook marketplace. Like I searched Facebook marketplace right before we recorded this to see if there was any free Braves gear and I found a t-shirt and some other random stuff. So, you know. Stuff is always there. And of course, if Facebook Marketplace in your area doesn't work, then Craigslist is old faithful. That's really interesting. I would have never thought to check. You know, quite honestly, my first thought was, I don't want to wear someone else's sweaty (laughs) T-shirt. It's not sweaty. A lot of this stuff. It was sweaty once. (laughs) No, a lot of this stuff is new. You know how like if you go to the games, they'll shoot it out the cannon. Or, you know, if you work for a company that did like some sort of sponsorship, you just got a bunch of stuff. And a lot of people are now, instead of sending that to the landfills, just putting it online and see if somebody wants it. Yeah. You're making me think of our friend Jason, who is an expert at yes. finding those things and tapping into this fandom. He is a level f- five black belt. eBay seller. Uh, eBay seller. Mm-hmm. He taps into those things. He finds those people. This guy can find 1962 memorabilia <laughs> that no one else can find in the world, adds a little premium, sells it, and that's what he uses to help fund his own fandom. Yes, and he, pay down his debt. And pay down his debt. Shout yeah. out to you, Jason. Shout out to Jason. He knows who he is. <laughs> All right, let's be fair. Uh, we've spoken poorly of car lovers. No, we have not. <laughs> we have <laughs> you have judged car lovers. <laughs> shamed sports fans. Uh, <laughs> I think it's only fair that we point the finger at ourselves um, and talk about uh, food and wine. Yes. Is that a hobby, though? Is or is that a, a necessity or a for life? It, is. <laughs> it depends on the price point. It do- oh. Because <laughs> beans and rice. Beans and expensive. rice can be expensive. I it mean, can be. Some yeah, restaurants that's true. charge way too truffle much. Truffle rice. Truffle rice and peas or something like Whatever. that. Whatever. Anyway, food and wine, uh, incredibly, incredibly sp- expensive. Um, let's just talk about fancy restaurants. We don't go to nearly as many fancy restaurants these days as we used to when we first started dating. There was pretty much a weekly thing several times a week. <laughs> yeah. The last time we went to a, I wouldn't call it fancy, but we walked away and it was okay. Yeah, that's been that's been our biggest deterrent is that you are harder to please now. When you see that bill, it's like, eh, it, it was all right. Like, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's not worth hearing the complaints to go out to for a nice meal because you're just going to be like, it was good. But was it $300 good? I don't know. Yeah. That's a flight. It is. Well, that's usually my line. Yeah. That's a flight. That's a flight is your response to just about <laughs> to anything. Anything over yeah. two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it don't even have to be two hundred dollars. Yeah. No, but I, I think there's some cases where those things are fine. Um and, and you're right. I, my bar is pretty high with restaurants. That's because of my familiarity with working in them. Um and because you know, I work hard for my money. You know, like when I go out, I want not just to have a good culinary experience. I want to have a good service experience, too. And unfortunately, these days, that is just seems like it's a little harder to come by. I love that quote that you always say. I'm probably going to get it wrong. But you say something like the biggest problem with chefs today is that they've never had to pay nine dollars for a salad. Yeah. And I didn't come up with that. That was actually a, a message from an old chef that I used to work with. And he was actually referring to other young chefs. And he was saying that their challenge was, you don't you don't know what it feels like yeah. to spend that much money, right? So you're just throwing it together, tossing it on a plate, but you're not thinking about the fact that somebody paid $10 for that. Listen, I paid $10 for a salad. You make my salad with love. Yeah. You make it with the care and love that it deserves. Okay. <laughs> Message received. <laughs> you will have a lightly tossed Caesar salad <laughs> and you will like it. <laughs> um, so that's the food aspect of it. Wine, uh, drinks, cocktails, that can be mm-hmm. pretty expensive as well. Um, you know, I'm familiar with that. I, one of the best benefits when I used to work in a restaurant is we used to be able to buy our wine at wholesale cost. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So we used to just, you know, drop $1,500, you would get, you know, 
case of some of your finest and favorite wines that are available out there at really about a third of the cost because the markup in restaurants is typically around two and a half to three times what the wholesale cost is. Mm. Um, so I would say, you know, in those cases, buy in bulk. That's a very big fans. If you're going to drink it, buy it in bulk. And instead of going to the store, let's say once a week or something like that, if you can, most package stores will offer like a case discount. Some even offer like a half case discount. But I would say that's a really interesting uh, or a great way to save some money. Um, bourbon and whiskey is mm. having a moment. It's been a couple yes. of years now. Bourbons are... My vice. There are so many bourbon and whiskey brands I available know. right now. And I would say on average, like it's at least for a good bottle, 40 to 50 bucks. Yep. Easily. So yeah. Same thing. Now, I don't know that they offer case discounts for No, typically spirits. they don't. I think you can get bigger sizes if you go to like the distillery direct. Yeah. But typically that bottle price is the price. Yeah. Yeah. So buy in bulk, uh, find one that you like and, um, you know, pregame a little bit. But I feel like the natural response here is like, oh, well, this is why we cook at home. Cook at home, right? It's one of the best ways. And honestly, you're going to enjoy, you know, the food that you make at home more than you do yeah. going out to a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe. I cook pretty well. And so I can say that with confidence. But, you know, a lot of people actually don't really cook that well. They can't replicate what they can get in a store. And on top of that... Because especially in the last year, there's been such a resurgence of people cooking at home. Now the cost of like gadgets and tools have kind of gone through the roof. One of the big things that I've seen, especially over the last couple of years, and I think this has kind of gone in tandem with the rise of bourbon, right, Mm -hmm. is barbecue or grills, Mm -hmm. right? So grills are all the rage right now. We actually have Two grills. Mm -hmm. We have one grill uh, that I would say is your straightforward propane grill. It's simple, gets hot quick. You can fire that thing up and you're cooking in, let's say, 20 minutes. But then we've got the fancy grill, which is a whole thing. So the regular grill, that one may cost you like three, three hundred and fifty dollars. You can get larger versions that are maybe like 400, 450, but the fancy grills now, like the Kamado uh, style grills or like the big green egg, those things easily, you're talking about 900, in some cases like Mm $2,000 for those grills. Now, are they worth it? Totally up to you. I absolutely (laughs) love the grilling experience, the versatility of those grills, but I will say most of the people that I know are only using those grills to cook things that they could put on a regular $200 grill. Like if you're just making burgers and hot dogs, it's probably not worth a (laughs) $2,000 piece of ceramic (laughs) equipment to help you make burnt hot dogs. (laughs) Shade. (laughs) Yeah, you know, but it's not just the cost of the grill. It's the learning curve. Yeah. Most people, I, I get asked all the time, man, I don't know how to use this thing because it's not like you can turn it up from high to medium. You've got to manage the airflow and all these things. It's incredibly complicated. Some of them have apps that manage the airflow going Mm -hmm. in and out. Um, And then on top of that, it's not like you can just go to the store and get like regular, you know, charcoal briquettes. Like these grills, those fancy grills require special lump charcoal. Mm -hmm. And those things are easily $25 a bag instead of like the $6 or $7 that you would get for the regular stuff. And on top of that, you have a wide array of like wood chips. Yeah. And different versions of the wood chips. Some are like finer versions. Some are chunks. Like it's a whole thing. And a lot of people don't think about like the cost of ownership. No. When they get into these hobbies that require, you know, some sort of equipment to get into them. Yeah. They see it on YouTube. They say, oh my gosh. Or they see it on Instagram and say, I want to do that. And wow, we could save so much money yeah. from going out if we just got the fancy grill. I can tell you as someone who has cooked professionally and has been cooking at a high level for the last 20 years, learning how to cook, mastering the technique is far more powerful and advantageous than just getting some fancy piece of equipment. The yes. equipment can't teach you how to cook. It may make a couple of things easier, but it doesn't just naturally by itself make it makes you look like you know how it to cook. It does. <laughs> if you pose in front of a fancy yeah. grill, it looks like you know what you're doing. It does look better on the gram. Because you can't taste on the gram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of other like small tips to add to that. I, I am someone who struggles in the kitchen. I think that's no secret to anyone. No but, 
<laughs> but I have found uh, the most helpful and amazing resource has been YouTube. And it is all about, like Julian said, kind of lowering the cost of that learning curve. It's amazing how much you can learn to cook by watching others cook. And there's a video on YouTube for just about everything. <laughs> so there are lots of ways to kind of get better and decrease the cost of experimenting because you're literally watching someone do it. It's yep. not as edited or curated as some of like the home cooking shows on Food Network where, you know, an assistant likely prepped <laughs> that meal. You can actually see people prepping in their kitchen, which is very helpful. Yeah. I'm really glad you let that cat out the bag. Because yeah. most people <laughs> think that the chefs that are uh, on food television or all those shows have cooked every single thing that you see. And no, there's an entire staff of people oh, yeah. that did all that stuff. Yes. And for the drinkers out there, there's nothing wrong with a little pregame before you go. I feel we, like we need to add like a drink responsibly <laughs> disclaimer. I know. Drink right responsibly. Here. Don't drive. Take an Uber. Um, but we actually used to go beyond pre-gaming. We used to pre-eat mm -hmm. <laughs> before we went to restaurants. Do you remember that? We'd have like a snack to be less hungry by the time we got there yeah. to lower the bill. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, in all seriousness, happy hours present discounted opportunities to try stuff off the menu. Or a lot of restaurants will have days where uh, wine bottles are half off. So it gets you a little closer to the retail price of that wine. It still is not going to get you to the at cost price that Julian was talking about. But that alcohol upcharge in restaurants is a beast. Yeah. So if you don't want to pay two and a half times what it costs retail, you know, going on a, a night off will get you closer to like one and a half times what it costs. I can only imagine what the single people are thinking right now. It's like, oh, it's easy for you to say you guys are in love and you're married. You know, you try doing that on a day. Well, know, there's a guy or, you know, there's a whole <laughs> that was actually gonna be my legion next. of people I know. who are like, oh, you say that. And then I show up <laughs> to the date with a Groupon. And next thing you know, so you're conning me tip. on social media. <laughs> that was my next tip was to use Groupon. Like <laughs> a lot of people still sleep on Groupon, but there are great deals to try different spots in town. And at this point, Groupon has like a whole app situation. So it's not like you're pulling out a big old piece of paper like like you can be a little discreet about your coupon usage if you think you're going to be judged. But at this point in time, like after all we've been through as a country, <laughs> I feel like if you are splitting hairs and judging people over using a coupon, you need to do some inner work because there's a lot happening right now. And I just feel like that's the last thing that you should clown somebody about is trying to save a little money. That's after very a progressive of you. I know. On behalf of all men through the history of Earth, <laughs> I thank you for that. <laughs> Don't discriminate on ladies. Girl, use You're right. your Groupon. You're right. That's a, a great. I've been trying to, trying to do this like hydrotherapy spa, and it's normally very expensive. But my friend told me that he got um, access to one through Groupon, and it's like seventy percent off. And I was like, I'm gonna try it. Anyway, if you are hesitant about Groupon, the other and last alternative I'll give you is to use points. Now, we recorded a points episode a couple of weeks ago. It's episode five. But points and loyalty programs are a great way to lower the cost of food and wine. Open Table has its own point system. So yep. if you want to make a reservation, you can get a part of their loyalty program. But beyond that, credit card companies will often offer incentives to try local merchants. So if there's a new restaurant in your town that is looking for foot traffic, you know, open up your Chase app or your Bank of America app, whoever you bank with, uh, and see if there's any sort of bonuses that you can use. Look at you, frugal Fran. <laughs> I love it. I like my hobbies. I'm not giving up on them. If there's ways to just kind of lower the cost and still do it, I'm going to find that way. You are. You are yeah. a savvy shopper. I, I will am. give you that credit. Okay, so... We've spoken about three of the big ones. I think those are the three big hobbies that most people, you know, could oh, probably there's, make. Yeah. There's definitely like derivatives of each of them, like yeah. golfers and hikers and, and there's a, skydivers. There's a social justification for every single one of them. Oh. Or in some cases, a professional yes. justification for every single one of them. So, yeah, I think in recent months, maybe the last couple of years, I've picked up photography and like video editing. Mm -hmm. That's been fun. Um, and it's one of those things that I will say part of the reason why I was hesitant is because I was like, all right, if you start this thing, then you know it's going to be tough because you get the camera, then you need the tripod, mm -hmm. and then you need the lighting rig, and then you need the cage, and then you need the mic. 
You know, and it's it doesn't stop before you know it. You spent three, four thousand dollars, and you still don't know how to use your camera. Right. But it's just sitting there collecting dust. Yes. Yeah. That's 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 interesting. That's not the case here. We've actually <laughs> used it quite a bit, uh, and so that's that's helpful. Uh, creative writing, I would say, is another hobby mm-hmm. that we've taken up. Um, yep. Yeah. Travel. So, travel. Yeah. 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 I haven't quite taken up crypto trading or day trading, but. I plan to add that to my list of hobbies in the next couple of months. Oh, good. Maybe not months. Maybe next year. I don't know when I'll have time to kind of dedicate or money. You're going <laughs> to take a it. class? Yeah, there's a lot of cl- classes available that kind of teach you the ins and outs of how it works. But I, I still think when it comes to stuff like that, experience is the best teacher. And it requires some capital. Well, that's not exactly true. There are like practice sites where you can kind of practice with fake money. Okay. Just going to dive into the deep end, huh? Yeah, why not? All right. <laughs> Just burn all the money. <laughs> I said I could use fake money. Bro, burn all the fake money. <laughs> Perfectly fine with that. Yeah, so this is actually making me think of that article that you sent me from the IRS, which mm-hmm. was really exciting yes. as a business owner and as a food and wine enthusiast. Uh, but essentially, the article was promoting the IRS and them offering a temporary exception through the end of 2022 that allowed business owners to write off essentially 100% of the spend at restaurants, so long as the owner is present, Right. which, you know, I want to get into the details around like, well, present as in like present at the table or present, <laughs> present at the restaurant, in the building or present in spirit because their picture was on the wall. But no, um, it, I was excited about that because we have business projects that directly benefit from that. And we also have personal interest in food and wine. Yeah. And so that's an incentive to go out to these restaurants as long as you can have a justifiable business reason behind it. So yes. that's pretty cool. Come through policy change. Yes, if you can. See, that's my version of, you know, I guess. Rouponing. (laughs) Rouponing. It's to figure out the tax code. It's to figure out the tax code (laughs) and find a way to write it off and roll it into the business. Okay. Yeah. One is a little more exciting than the other. You know, one's I'll let y'all pick. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So, hobbies. They're expensive. They're fun. Cars. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Food. Wine. Mm -hmm. Travel. All of it. Sports. What are your final thoughts? My final thoughts are that a good hobby should be entertaining, fulfilling, and should enhance your life. So if it's not doing that last part because it's at odds with your financial goals, then something has to change. Like I said, it doesn't have to be as drastic as quitting the hobby cold turkey altogether, but you might need to tweak it a little bit so you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. I I need to look up the origins of that phrase, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Like, who is Peter? And is he okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Why? Anyway, your what's mom, your final Your thought? mom has the answer. She probably does. She, I know it's biblical. It's yeah, sound biblical. She'll tell you the whole story about yeah, Peter. Yeah, well, Peter, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> My bottom line is do the math. Do the math. I think a lot of people like to think of their hobbies as sacred cows. They are a part of your identity, they are your point of entry to your community, or in some cases, your family. It's the thing that brings you all together. But you really have to do the math to think about how much these things are costing you in the short run and in the long run. I'm not saying or suggesting that you completely discard these hobbies, but even if you just trim them a little bit and chose to invest some of that money instead, it could have a tremendous, tremendous impact on your ability to retire more comfortably or even earlier. Yes, I love that. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success. If you're in the market for a hobby, I have one for you. It's leaving five-star ratings and reviews if you like what you heard. It's free. (laughs) It's free. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Bye.